Welcome back everyone to Complex Analysis. So um, I know the last couple of videos have been really algebraically intense. We you know, completed the square a couple of times. We were solving rational equations. Today I promise is not gonna be as, as intense. Um, so today and in the next video, we're gonna be focusing on extending our favorite calculus functions or the functions that we used a lot in calculus. So today we're gonna to focus on the exponential functions and the trig functions. Um, and then next time we're gonna deal with something that's a little bit more tricky, uh, the logarithm function. So in any case, let's go ahead and get started. Now before we get into that, I wanna kinda talk about extending functions because what I really mean is we, we are extending functions. So for instance, in calculus, we dealt a lot with our favorite exponential function, e to the x, right? Now this was a function from the real numbers to, if you wanna get really, really precise, zero to infinity. Okay. Now when we extend functions, what we're going to be trying to do is we're going to try to come up with a, a complex version of this that instead has a domain of not r, but c. Okay. Um, now when we extend functions, one thing that you're going to want to get comfortable with, and I think this will make the rest of the video a little bit more clear, is whenever we extend a function, what we want to do is we want to extend it in such a way that when we restrict, meaning if we go backwards, we get the same function out, okay? So we don't want to extend a function such that if we try to go back, we don't get the same thing in the end. So the, the way we're defining these, these complexified calculus functions, it's going to seem a little bit strange, but we're sort of building off of what we did back in calculus in a way, okay? So you will see e to the x popping up when we try to um, define e to the z. Okay? But just keep that in the back of your minds. When we extend functions, okay, we want to make sure we extend it so that if we do go back, which sometimes you need to do when you're doing math things, you want to get that original function back out. Okay? So just keep that in the back of your heads. When we're defining these functions, it may seem a little strange, but there's a reason for that. Another reason is that we want to sort of capture the same kind of properties our original functions had. Remember, e to the x has a lot of cool properties, right? like e to the x times e to the y is e to the x plus y. e to the x raised to the r is equal to e to the x r. So when we're extending these functions, we want to try to capture a lot of these old properties as well. Now, not everything's going to transfer over, especially when we get to the logarithm. We'll see one of our favorite properties of logs doesn't actually hold in the complex sense. But in any case, keep those two things in mind. When we extend we want to extend so that if we go back or restrict, we get the same function or the function that we originally started with. And when we extend, we also want to capture as much as we can all those nice properties that we had. Okay, so let's start with the exponential function. So we define the exponential function as follows. So our notation for this right now is going to be exp. We'll eventually see e to the z in a little bit. But in any case, we define um, exp of z, so exponential of z. So we define it as e to the x. Remember, x is the real part of your imaginary function, uh, imaginary number z. And then times cosine of y plus i sine of y. Or written slightly differently, e to the x times e to the i y. Now this definition shouldn't come as a complete surprise because we did see this earlier. But in any case, this is how we define the complex exponential function. Okay. All right. Now again, this might seem a little bit strange, but the way we define this, one, if we restrict to real numbers, we still get e to the x, and two, we still do get a lot of nice properties. Although we do get a lot more properties, but we do still get a lot of nice properties. So first property, x of z1 times x of z2 is equal to x of z1 plus z2. So exactly the same property that we saw or just talked about earlier. B. 1 over x of z is equal to x to the negative z. So for instance, let's go back to real land. 1 over e to the x, remember, can be written as e to the negative x. So that's kind of what's being captured in property b here. Now something that's completely new here is part c. Our exponential functions are now periodic. Okay, So x of z plus 2 pi i is equal to x of z. So this is telling us that our function is now periodic, just like trig functions were, okay? And that's actually why exponential is periodic now, because remember, we're defining our complex exponential function with that cosine y plus i sine of y, okay? 
So now we have a, a new property for our complex exponential functions. They repeat themselves, whereas that never happened with regular old e to the x. That function is not periodic. It just looks like this, right? OK, uh, part d, or property d, I should say. So the length of the exponential function is equal to exp of the real part of z. Okay. And that kind of has a Pythagorean theorem flavor to it. Uh, e, the exponential function, like it is in the real case, is never 0. Okay. So you can't plug in an exponent into your function and get 0 out. And then uh, another classic property that we loved back in calculus, the derivative of the exponential function is just the exponential function again. Okay, So we got a lot of similar properties that we had back in calculus, but we have a couple of new ones here. Okay, I'm going to put new. All right, so you should be able to prove all of these, by the way. We're going to prove C together, because again, that's a new one. So we're going to prove that um, the exponential function of z plus 2 pi i is equal to the exponential of z. Okay. So how do we prove that? Well, the first thing I'm going to do, well, let's just recall what is x of z. So by definition, this is e to the x times cosine of y plus i times sine of y. Okay. And remember, where are x and y coming from? Remember, x and y are coming from the real and imaginary parts of z. So z is equal to x plus i, y. OK. So to prove that this equality holds, we're going to start with the more complicated side like we usually want to do. Okay. So we're going to start with x of z plus 2 pi i. And what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite z in terms of its real and imaginary components. OK, now that we have this, what we're going to do is we are going to factor out i from our right two terms. So this is x of x plus i times y plus 2 pi. OK, and now we are pretty much good to go to use our definition of the exponential. So remember, the exponential e to the z, and I'm going to put z bar here. So just that, actually not z bar because that means conjugate. Let's use, um, let's use, we're going to use tilde. OK, so e to the z tilde, by definition, is e to the real part, real, times cosine of the imaginary part plus i sine of the imaginary part. OK. So just keep that in the back of your heads. Again, the exponential function, if you want to break it down, it's just e to the real part, where this is the real exponential function that we had back in, in um, good old uh, in calculus. And oh, and by the way, this, this is off a little bit. This should be exp, not e to the z tilde. We haven't seen why we can do that yet. We have to be a little bit more careful there. Um, in any case, the exponential function of your complex number is, again, e, where this is the calculus e, to the real part times cosine of the imaginary part plus i times sine of the imaginary part. Now, the reason why I'm bringing that up is we're going to go ahead and use that on our new expression here. So what's the real part? Well, the real part is still just x. okay? But the imaginary part is not y, but it's y plus 2 pi. So when we apply our definition, we're going to get e to the x which we're sort of happy with because that's what we want, okay. times cosine of y plus 2 pi plus i sine y plus 2 pi. Okay. Now, again, keep in mind, what do we want? If we look up here at the top middle here, we don't want cosine of y plus 2 pi. We want cosine of y, and we don't want sine of y plus 2 pi. We want sine of y. Well, luckily, if you guys remember your trig, remember cosine and sine, they're periodic functions, right? And what's the period of sine and cosine? It's exactly 2 pi. So what that means is we can rewrite this as x e to the x times cosine of. We can get rid of the 2 pi because we'll get the same output plus i sine of y, which is exactly what we wanted to show.
check. Okay, so now our complex exponential functions are periodic. And it's coming from the fact that we're sort of defining them with these trig functions. Okay, now speaking of the trig functions, how do we define the trig functions? Well, we define the trig functions in terms of the exponential functions. Okay, so it's a little bit different, very different from a trig class. Right? Remember trig, we define sine and cosine using the unit circle. Well, in complex land, we actually define sine and cosine using the exponential function. So again, a little bit more complex and really cool, but a little bit more complex nonetheless. So sine of z is defined to be 1 over 2i x of i times z minus x of minus i z. And cosine defined similarly, although there are some differences. So now it's 1 half, so not 1 over 2i, but 1 half x of i z plus sine of negative i z. Okay? So that's how we define sine and cosine in complex analysis. We use the exponential function to do so. Tangent and cotangent are defined like they would in a trig class. So tangent is just sine over cosine. And if you simplify that, you actually get this expression here, minus i x 2iz minus 1 over x 2iz plus 1. And similarly, cotangent is cosine over sine. And if you simplify that, you get this expression here. Okay. Now, I will say if you wanted to define the other two trig functions, secant and cosecant, you would define those similarly as well meaning like secant would be 1 over cosine and cosecant would be 1 over sine. OK, um, so here's some properties of our sine and cosine function. So first of all, and some of these are, are, are well, they're pretty much this as similar as what we would get back in, in calculus. Nothing's too strange. Now, this first one here, depending on what kind of calculus class you took, you may have seen that or you may not have seen it. But in any case, sine of minus z is equal to minus sine of z. Now, in calculus, you may have seen this as another property. This means that sine is what we would call an odd function in calculus. So an odd function is a function such that f of minus x is equal to minus f of x, meaning you can sort of factor out the negative sign. Whereas cosine, notice what happens to the negative sign. It goes away. So this would be odd. And if the negative sign, if you can write it like this, so f of negative x equals f of x, we would call that an even function even. Now, if you haven't seen that in calculus, don't worry about that. That's just sort of more information than you need. But nonetheless, they do have these properties. So sine of uh, minus z is equal to minus sine of z. Cosine of minus z is equal to cosine of z. So another way of thinking about that is you can sort of factor out negative signs from your sine, and cosine sort of eats up negative signs. All right, property two. Um, sine and cosine are still periodic with period 2 pi. Okay, so that's again another property that's, that's very familiar to us in, in, from calculus. Um, tangent and cotangent are still periodic and they have period pi. Again, not too surprising if, if you're good with your trig. Okay, uh, next property, sine of z plus pi over 2 e is equal to cosine of z. And likewise, cosine of z plus pi over 2 is equal to minus sine of z. Now, this is another one that this, this isn't too surprising um, if you're familiar with your trig, because that's exactly what happens in trig land. You can always take sine or cosine and um, shift them so that you get the other one. Okay, And it's actually by pi over 2 in the trig case as well. Okay, But in any case, what this is sort of saying is that there's a connection between sine and cosine, and basically you can shift one to get the other, which again shouldn't be surprising. Just think about the graphs of sine and cosine. They're basically the same, right? You just have to shift one to get the other. Okay. Um, the next property, again, this is one if you're good with your trig, shouldn't be too surprising. We have some formulas for sine and cosine. So sine of z1 plus z2 is equal to sine of z1 cosine of z2 plus sort of the flip cosine of z1 sine of z2 and then cosine of z1 plus z2 is equal to cosine of z1 cosine of z2 minus sine of z1 sine of z2 okay next property so we have the pythagorean identity so cosine squared plus sine squared is still equal to one and we have sort of a double angle formula here cosine squared minus sine squared is equal to cosine of 2z and now this Pythagorean identity, you guys should be super comfortable with that. We use that all the time in calculus. The double angle formula, maybe in calc 2 when you're doing trig integrals, but um, 
In any case, that is something that you should, should have seen in a trig class for sure. And then lastly, our favorite derivative rules, the derivative of sine is still cosine, and the derivative of cosine is still minus sine. Okay? So for the tr in the trig case, we're actually getting pretty much the same um, properties that we got back in trig and calculus. So none of this is really too surprising. Now there is one surprising thing though. If you think about sine and cosine in the real case, okay, remember the range of sine and cosine was negative one to one, right? They never got above one, they never got below negative one. Well, one difference between complex sine and cosine and real comp uh, sine and cosine is that complex sine and cosine are actually unbounded, meaning we can make them as big as we want to. Okay. Now, how do you see that? Well, let's go ahead and look at sine for a second. So sine of z, remember by definition, is 1 over 2i x of iz. Now I always forget, is it minus or plus? Let's go with minus for a second, and we're going to double check that. Oh, look at that. Yeah, OK, we're good. We are good. OK, so here's our definition of sine, right? Now, what happens if we plug in i times y? Remember, we're writing z as x plus i, y, right? Well, what if we didn't have any real part? What if it was just imaginary? Okay. So let's see what happens with this. We'll get sine of i, y, which is equal to 1 over 2i, x of i times i, y, minus x of minus i, i, y. Okay. Now let's simplify this. This looks sort of terrible. Uh, so this is 1 over 2i. And then now i times i, this is going to give us negative y here, minus x of negative i times i. This is going to give us a positive i. I'm, par I'm sorry, positive 1. So we just get y in the end. OK. Now we like this a little bit because remember, the exponential function on just real numbers, and remember, y is real. Okay, i, y is complex, but y is real. We're just going to get in the end here 1 over 2i e to the negative y, where this is really the real complex function that we're nor we hopefully are used to and normally deal with, minus e to the y. Okay. So sine of i, y in the end is just 1 over 2i e to the minus y minus e to the y. Now, if we let y get really big, Okay, so and we're talking about in, in a complex real sense, if we let y go to infinity, well, this is going to go to 0 because 1 over e to the y. If y gets really big, this will go to 0. So our first term here will go to 0. And our second term, this will go to, well, minus infinity, right? Or this will go to infinity at least, OK? So what that means for us is that we can actually make the sine function as big as we want it to be, meaning that it's actually not bounded. Okay, which is very, very different from our normal sine and cosine. Remember, sine and cosine can only be as big as 1 and as small as negative 1. But in the complex uh, land, or the complex sine and cosine, we can actually make them as big as we want to by just considering i, y, a purely imaginary complex number, and letting y get as big as we want it to be. Kind of cool. Super, super cool. OK. Um, last thing we're just going to talk about, and again, this depends on um, what kind of calculus you've taken and what kind of trig class you've taken, but we can define the hyperbolic trig functions. Now, if you guys use what's called Wolfram to do integrals, you probably have seen these pop up. And that usually tells instructors that you used Wolfram because any, any um, integration technique we teach you does not involve these at all. But in any case, I think it's good to know anyway. But in any case, these, uh, the hyperbolic trig functions can be defined as follows. And like they are in the real sense, they're defined in terms of the exponential functions. So sine hyperbolic is 1 half e, uh, x z minus x of negative z. Kind of close to sine, but a little bit different because we don't have i's floating around. Cosine hyperbolic, 1 half x z plus x of minus z. 
Again, very similar to regular cosine, except we don't have i's floating inside our exponential functions. Tangent hyperbolic is sine hyperbolic over cosine hyperbolic, and cotangent is cosine over sine. Okay. Now, I wouldn't worry too much about these functions. Like, if you're, if you're like, I've never seen a hyperbolic function before, we're not going to deal with them too much. But for those of you that have seen hyperbolic, we can extend our hyperbolic trig functions from real numbers to complex numbers in a very, very similar way. Okay. With the same, well, similar properties, I should say, that they had back in the real sense.